Blessings. Welcome to James chapter 2 in our Wednesday evening Bible study. Um, I might have done too much history last time, but I wanted to get you familiar with the setting of James, which was to understand the urgency of being prepared to be a living witness to the gospel. And um, the emphasis in chapter 2, you'll find, is to be a living witness to each other in the gospel. So one is outward bound and the other was designed primarily for Christianity's fellowship in the church. So let's ask the Lord for a, a blessing in prayer before we go any further. Thank you, Lord, for the rain we receive and for the beauty of summer. Thank you, Lord, for your presence in our life and in our world. Pour out your spirit upon us as we study the word together and as we live our life in faith uh, among each other and with each other. Bless the churches that are struggling, Lord, with decisions about when to worship at church and how to go about it, for we are part of that group. Help us, Lord, to make the right decisions and lead us with your wisdom. And in the consensus of our joint faith, help us come to the right conclusion as we seek to bear witness to one another and uphold the gospel for the world. Help us, Lord, to be humble by the truth that we read in Scripture, by the assurance that comes about the love of God, the mercy and forgiveness of Christ, and the strength and the resolve the Holy Spirit brings to our heart. And help us, Lord, to see as we live this life of faith, to see the treasure in each other. For each of us are a treasure to one another. Help us not to withhold our treasure in the giving. Help others to not ignore the treasure we offer. Be with us then as we study this word in James and make it holy unto our faith and heart and let it honor and glorify Christ. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. James chapter 2. My brothers and sisters, do you, with your acts of favoritism, really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? I told you that James gets harder as you go along. I need to remind you of that. For if a person with gold rings and wearing fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the other one who is poor you say, stand over there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges carrying evil thoughts. Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in the faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he promised to all those who love him? You have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who oppress you. It's, it's, it's this, this question. Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme at the excellent name that was invoked over you. So you will do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, which is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you've become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. In this case, the gospel is the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That's a pretty tall order. Be as respectful and genuine and loving and receptive to the poor 
as you are to those who are in high status. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, what good is it if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? By the way, Martin Luther, this used to drive Martin Luther crazy. Um, the German Reformed leaders were so distressed by James because James said, if, if you have this faith you brag on so much and this faith you depend on so strongly, does this faith not lead you to works of righteousness? And Luther was so busy trying to make sure people understood that salvation comes by faith in the grace of God that is shed abroad in our hearts through Jesus Christ. And no one, no, no Protestant, no Catholic can argue that point. But what, what is at stake here is the emphasis James puts on how does your faith operate in the world? What's your faith like? Is it your little private faith that you keep welled up in your heart, knowing yourself to be saved by grace? Or is it a faith that moves you outward into the world among people in need? So can faith save you? Well, yes, James, yes, faith is what saves us. But if a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of you will say, well, go in peace and keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do nothing to, to, to supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. Ooh. He makes a compelling argument, one we need to pray about and think about and, and respect. You know, if we wanted, you'll never get me to argue that there's anything we can do in our works that would bring us to salvation. I will argue all day, that's true. You can't earn your way to heaven. You can't do good works thinking that they will add points to your, to your score. It's not how it works. But you need to have a heart that is open to be available to the needs of people that God puts in your path to the degree that your faith is evident. Mercy, forgiveness, patience, I don't like that at all. I, I wish we didn't have to be nice to anybody. We could just, I wish we could just close the doors of the church and sit there and talk about how we're saved and, and you know, eat our fellowship meal and go home. But we can't do that. Jesus wants us to have our doors open and our hearts open and our minds open to the complexities of this world and its suffering and to the myriad sources that we have available to us to offer help. Is it possible that you might help someone who will be ungrateful? I guarantee it. Is it possible that you could take great pains or your church group could take great pains in helping someone who would take the help and never give it another thought and never respond in any way that's positive. Yeah, that's possible too. But there are those who will respond. And in particular, if you can make the world a safer place for children, It's worth the trouble. Just the children alone. Of course, you know, grandmother was sick, grade school teacher, and then she taught kindergarten. And and uh, so I grew up seeing my grandmother's care for children, not just in our community, not just in our family, but in her classroom. And so... I understand that if, if you want to, and so if you have a hard time being good to grown-ups, fine. Find an opportunity to go somewhere where you can be good to children. Someone may say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I by my works will show you my faith. That's a, that's a, that's a trap. Don't worry about whose works or what or how deep somebody's faith is, we have our faith in Christ 
Faith in a mercy that goes beyond our reason and reaches past our sin and redeems us from the judgment of our own disobedience. This was done at Calvary through Christ on his cross. It was witnessed and testified to in Christ's ministry and teaching. And it is certainly revealed in the resurrection. And it is the glory of the ascension and is the sure and certain truth of the second coming. So don't get caught up in arguing about who has more faith or who has more works. Don't worry about that stuff. There's not a point system here. Take your faith and use it as God leads as best you can with a humble heart that Jesus may be seen and visible. So your, your, your works and your faith are born of your belief and acceptance and trust in this thing in verse 19. You believe that God is one, you do well. And of course, by this time, when the early church says, by 62 AD, when the early church says, God is one, God is one. You know, in Hebrew, Deuteronomy, is it chapter six, eight? Yeah, I think it is, six, eight. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echud. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. That word, Echud, the Lord is one. And Billy Graham taught me this, by the way. I was watching one of his programs. Echud means a full and total unit component of one out of three essences. Now that's in Hebrew and that's from the old days. The Lord is one of three components. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Someone then will say, <clears throat> believe that God is one for you will do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. So there's a point in time when you say, well, I believe in the Lord. Well, that's good. Even the devil believes in the Lord. Do you want to be shown, you senseless people, that faith apart from works is barren? I like that phrase better. Was not our ancestor Abraham justified by works when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with its works, and faith was brought to completion by works. Okay, now I like, I like where he's going with this. I can live with this. I realize Luther, by this point, had a nervous breakdown when he read this because there were people in the, the Reformation was born out of the crisis of faith that was going around in his time the uncertainty in the world we've got that um, the scarcity of food we have that the things that were unsteady in governments and the, the threat of wars we have that the tension between the royalty of Europe and the church. Well, now we have tension between the whole world and the church. And 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 so Luther Luther said, these people are so scared they're trying to do good works and keep a list of them to give assurance that they're going to heaven. That's what the Reformation was truly about. Born of the passion an insistent spirit of God in Martin Luther, who said, salvation is received by faith, faith in Christ, the Son of the living God. James is not trying to contradict that, I don't think. I, don't really, I really don't think so. He's saying, now that you've got this faith alive in you, and so now that you've given your life to Christ, now that you're a Christian, what are you supposed to do? Well, roll up your sleeves, I guess and find some good that you can do for someone in Christ's name, not in your name, not for credit, not to get points, but let your, let your faith bring forth an open door to the Holy Spirit so that your heart can receive the love of God. And when your heart receives the love of God, when you open your heart to God, 
it can't help but spill out into the world. <coughs> Pardon me. A lot of times we we panic and think, well, how much good work can I do? Just go about your day and try not to be mean to somebody and have a kind word to give to somebody and try not to try not to get irritated if they say something that you don't like. Just be kind. God will show you by the working of the Spirit where he wants you to be or what he might want you to say or do. And that I promise. God does that because that's one of the things God does. If you keep your heart and mind stayed on the truth that you belong to God, you've been redeemed through God's love in Christ, and you're sustained in that salvation by the Holy Spirit, and you're guided by the truth of Scripture, and you're supported in the fellowship of, of the saints in church, all of a sudden, you have a lot behind you leading you forward, a lot underneath you holding you up, a lot over the top of you protecting you. So live your life and try to be good to people. You don't have to be good to everybody all at once. Start small. Start small. Start with what you know. And let your heart grow in the love of Christ by letting your heart be shared in the goodness that you possess be shared with others. Thus the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now that's, that's true and that's beautiful because Abraham was, you got to remember Abraham came from a wealthy family, most likely a powerful family and God called him away from Ur of the Chaldees, which is Babylon, to go live in the desert which was as barren as you could imagine. And there in the place God gave him, he gave the promise, I'll make you a great nation, I'll bless you, I'll bless those who bless you. And Abraham believed God. Now, did he believe all at once? No, it was a hard journey for Abraham, just like it's a hard journey for us. He, he got t bored and tired and decided to go down to Egypt and stay a while, and that didn't work out. So he came back to where God had made him stand. And, and then he got bored again, and he went up to the territory of Abimelech's kingdom and got in trouble and had to come back. And he found it hard to believe that his wife, Sarah, could have a child. And he tried to help God out there, and you know what, that, what happened. But ultimately, finally, at last, when God said, Give me your only son in sacrifice. And when he goes to do that, God stays his hand. And Abraham believed God. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And from that day on, he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In other words, a person is justified by the works. And, and I had a million notes, and, and I don't know where I put them, because if I do too much, if I do too much, uh, I don't want to look it up. I won't look it up. If I do too much of that, it bores you to death, I know. There is a, there is a, I can't remember the Greek word. It's long as cold weather. It's when your acts are a reflection of your faith in God, it is pleasing to God. And it's one word, and it means pleasing God by trusting his promise. I'll find the word for next time. Um, it may be in Romans. Hold on a second. What's the worst that can happen? Give me a second here. Ah! Aristobulant. Aristobulant. Which is pleasing God by trusting and believing. But it is associated always with an act. 
Okay, so Abraham believed God. It was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. A person is justified then, justified in the works and not by faith alone. He doesn't exclude faith. He says, do some stuff that pleases God just because you love him. Do some stuff that pleases God because when you're doing that, you're blessing someone. So relax, don't be too scared. Don't be hard on James. James is a good guy. James is giving his last letter to the church before either execution or imprisonment or whatever. But they're words of authority and they're words to be trusted and they're serious words. Please God with your kindness. Let your faith be witnessed in your mercy. Let the strength of your faith be carried on your desire to find good and to encourage good and to offer good to other people. Is that easy? I've never found it easy. It's kind of like looking back when I was in high school at teachers that cared about us. We had some really good teachers. We had some great teachers. Elementary school was paradise for us. We had to mind. There was order. But the teachers were not just there to teach us math and grammar and spelling. and They did that. And they weren't there to teach us about how to read and what's valuable about knowing reading. They had this, they lived a good life. And, and they weren't rattled to death by outside influences that expected 5,000 pages of paperwork to accompany their teaching. They were not encumbered by disturbances. They, they ran their classrooms. They were not afraid to share comments about faith. I don't. Rem I never had one teacher to try to get me to be a, a, a Presbyterian or a Baptist or a member of the Christian Church, or a Methodist. But I had lots of teachers who encouraged me to trust Christ. The same is true with high school. We had some great teachers in high school, and and uh, you know, I, <laughs> some were interesting and some were not as interesting. Some were. Strict and some were lenient, but I never felt ignored or forgotten or unimportant when I was in their classroom. Rock Hall made me work hard because he said I was smart enough that I had to work. And, uh, but. I loved him anyway. <laughs> he, he, we had to read a book each month. And I'd go look for books that I knew he hadn't read. And I know Rock Hall doesn't lie. And I never found a book and read a book that he hadn't already read. You didn't get a book report. You may as well just read the book because he knows it. So you better do a good job. Good people. By the way, Rock Hall used to get our octet together and take us to churches on Wednesday nights or Sunday mornings sometimes to sing in churches just to do that, you know. And all kinds of churches, different kinds of churches. Let's look at this again. Abraham believed in God reckoned then to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God. I have known some friends of God. School teachers come to mind first. I've known a few pretty good preachers too. Arlen Freshour being one. You see then that a person is justified by works that are accompanied by faith, not by faith alone. There's life 
that's born of your faith. By the way, we're almost finished, so there. I'm not going to be hard on you today. Likewise, remember Rahab, the prostitute? Now, how in the world are we going to go from somebody who's a figure of the faith, like Abraham, to Rahab, the prostitute? What do you mean, that bad women and so-called good men? Rahab, the prostitute, was justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by another road to keep them safe. You know, that was the Jericho thing when they blew the trumpets and tore the wall down and took over. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. Okay. Faith without works. I guess I guess that means that I guess that means that your works are a personal testimony to God and yourself, a private testimony between you and God about the faith you do carry. You remember the last two years of Mother Teresa's life, she struggled in her faith and belief about God. She'd seen so much suffering and so much death and poverty and so much sickness that she, you know, she was a nurse. That's what she did. That's what she did. Nuns are always, you know, doing something, teaching school, making children mind, being a nurse. Things that are hard jobs, hard jobs, thankless jobs sometimes. And the last two years of her life before she retired and came back to America, she said she had a hard time with her faith. which just scared me to death. I thought, she's she's a really good person. She really loves the Lord. And she had a hard time with her believing. She had a hard time with her faith. I mean, she didn't do any bad. She didn't smoke. She didn't drink. She didn't fight chicken. She didn't gamble. You know, she didn't go out carousing. She worked in that big barn that they turned into a hospital and an orphanage in a school. You know, Catholics, they'll give them, a, give them a chicken coop and they'll start a university. So while she was having this last two years in her old age of doubt and, and wonder and fear and her faith was assailed on every hand and side, who likes to assault your faith? The devil. If the devil will assault Mother Teresa, he'll assault anybody. The whole time she said, I will live like Jesus if that's all there is to do. Well, Mother Teresa, I thought you were having trouble with your faith. She was. Is Jesus just a story or is it true? Is the resurrection true? Is he coming again in this world of misery and poverty and war and hatred and, and violence and selfishness and licentiousness? Is it really true? She had a hard time believing. And she decided, well, I'll just keep living out through the works that I understand, the faith and the witness of Jesus. Uh, I believe that she understood James better than anybody. There are other people in my life whose names I will not mention, people that were strong witnesses to my own faith, encouraged and taught me in my faith. And I'm sure they had doubts about all kinds of things because there are people in my life whose lives were not easy. They were not simple. Now, they, they, they made me think it was. You know, they'd work in the garden after school and they'd can and they'd freeze things for winter and they'd gather 
socks and clothes for children and you know and they when we got out of hand they whip us with a fly swat you think that's nothing you couldn't survive some of the whippings I've had with fly swat but their faith was so active I don't know if they ever had any doubts but I'm sure they had some trials and I'm sure they wondered if it was worth the trouble to try to encourage a boy like me but somehow they decided that they were going to live the life that Jesus gave us as an example in spite of everything else if you look at James through those eyes I think you won't be worried about his insistence on good works. Not good works for credit. Not good works so people will brag on you. Now that's worthless. That's even deader than the dead faith that James talks about. No, good works to the glory of God. Pleasing God. Pleasing God. Not because you're afraid of God, but because you love God. Let us pray. <coughs> let our faith produce not only Christian character, O Lord, let our faith produce works that are in keeping with the life and example and call of Jesus. Help us never to begrudge the poor something that they need. Help us never to prefer one person over another because of their status. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name we humbly pray to be the kind of people who are called disciples, people that can be trusted, people whose lives are appreciated not for what they give so much as who they are, how they share and what they have open for someone else's heart or circumstance or sickness or weakness. Yes, Lord, indeed, forgive us of our sins. Our sins are many. And move us toward this perfected image of Christ that is the image we follow as we move toward his kingdom. And let good works abound in us, O Lord, for the sake of Christ to the honor and glory of his name. Give us patience, understanding. Let us see people the way you see them and love people the way you love them. And when we fall short, let us return to you to find strength and correction in the way we direct our lives that we may indeed be witnesses to the kingdom and to the gospel of Jesus in this world. For we ask it in his name, Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread, that which we need, the word, kindness from others, strength from your spirit. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, O Lord. Amen. God bless you. <laughs>